talk to you later. Okay, let me try it. Let's try it one more time and see what happens. Testing? We yeah, we probably need to say something or we're gonna not ever get the echo to come back. Testing? Okay, Commission President Rachel Lyle Smith. Oh, what? We're ready to open the meeting whenever you are. Oh, it's playing a video. <laughs> yeah, we probably need to say something or we're gonna not ever get the echo to come back. Testing? Okay, Commission President Rachel Lyle Smith. Oh, what? We're ready to open the meeting whenever you are. You're in a big loop. Video. <laughs> yeah, we probably need to say something or we're gonna. Yeah, uh, turn it off, I guess. <laughs> yeah, this isn't working. <laughs> and it's recycling. Hi, Bob. I don't hear you. If we're going to have it loop like that, I'd like to say something brilliant. So we hear it. <laughs> I don't think I have anything to say, though. It's yeah. <laughs> oh, OK, well, we'll just I'll talk to Katie and find out how to because that, that was not good. <laughs> All right. you didn't, tell me tell me when to start the meeting and I'll let you run after that. You may start the meeting. This is the January meeting of the Trans Oregon City Transportation Advisory Committee. And we will now start the roll call. Kim, if you would be so kind. Yes. Uh, ben Simmons is absent. Uh, Tim Morgan. Yes, I'm here. Uh, Tim West. Here. Ray Atkinson. Present. Henry McEnroe. Here. Bob LaSalle. Here. Shedemir Jessic. Here. And that's it. Thank you. you. Sounded what? like Shedemir and family. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what's the agenda so, like tonight? The next thing we'll do is approval of minutes from December 15th, 2020. I move that we approve those minutes. Any seconds? I second it. So, anybody have any discussion other than that we accept them? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed aye. say aye. All opposed? Anybody opposed? Any abstentions? They passed. All right. Uh, does anybody have anything they want to change about the agenda? The only thing I want, I'd like to add something, and that's just the fact that um, between now and our next meeting, there's going to be a commission retreat. And I know we're going to talk about goals um, a little bit anyway. If, um, so, you know, we need to think about that to some degree. I don't have a lot of information for you necessarily, but. Um, Something we can talk about. And so, on that note, John, um, <clears throat> when I reached out to Katie about uh, Bob presenting the annual report, yeah. it sounded like when he's going to do that is going to kind of uh, be based off of what happens at the January 21st commission meeting. So she said that it could be possibly February 3rd or it could be as late as June. So that's kind of up in the air. Well, the one thing I would say to Bob is, is if he wants to, would rather that I gave that presentation, I'm now free to do it. Well, why don't you go ahead and do it then? Uh, Henry, okay. Since you're the chair. All righty. Okay. Uh, we did not receive any public comments. And the next thing is basically just welcoming our new member, Tim. And I attach the bylaws to the, the agenda for you. Um, I also attach the schedule and what else did I attach? Uh, just the, the members' names. Um, so anyway, welcome. Thank you. Yes, I got them all. I read them all too. <laughs> I did my pretty simple. <laughs> We still okay. have, uh, I think, one opening, mm -hmm. one or two. 
we have seven, so we can have as many as nine. So did we, did we ever get anything from the chamber on what their preferences were? Tim? No, I've I've emailed the contact that Vance Tong gave me um, twice, and she hasn't responded. So I I messaged her. I think it was last week, and asked her if she had anything anybody that she was aware of that would want to serve, and I haven't. It's been cricket, so I don't. <clears throat> okay. Well, we can keep working on that. Yeah. Um, Tim, do you have any questions or anything like as far as what we do? Or <laughs> no, um, I think I got a pretty good idea. I'll I'll, I'll be kind of quiet for a little bit till I get you know, my feet wet. But um, I, yeah, I read through all the things. I saw some things I was kind of aware of, and there was things I wasn't aware of. So. Um, I try to get up to speed here and I just hope that there's a day soon that we can all meet together <laughs> instead of this uh, virtual stuff. I'm tired of district meetings and virtual mode and, <laughs> yeah. and other things that I do in my regular job. <laughs> well, there's one advantage too of meeting in person uh, that you may not be aware of, but when we do that, the city also provides us dinner a half hour before the meeting starts. Oh, that sounds even better. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm eating a, a snack tray because I had to commute home from Tiger. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I was surprised the traffic wasn't too bad tonight. So I got home, but not enough to get a dinner. So my wife says, uh, it's in the refrigerator. I'm going over my son's. <laughs> so, uh, John, you, you mentioned that there's possibility of perhaps a some new and different goals and normal coming out of the retreat? Is there well, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's that's pretty wide open, so we don't exactly know what the commission's focus is going to be, but I'm just thinking about some of the goals. So a couple things, um, if I can jump in early here. Um, so the, tomorrow night, the commission's going to go over the uh, community survey that we've done. We did it in 2018. We did it in uh, 2020. And the results of that are available. So there's, you know, you'll see um, if you watch that movie or, or watch that movie, watch that uh, uh, meeting and uh, either live or, or recorded, you'll see um, kind of some of the results. I don't know how deep they're going to go into that. There's a presentation that really gets pretty, um, stays pretty high level. Um, but if you look deeper at the at the community satisfaction survey, you know, um, for us for transportation, um, you know, I think we did better this year than we did in 2018. Um, but there was still a lot of um, interest in from the folks that completed the survey in more pavement maintenance and uh, less congestion. So. Um, there were a lot of comments on, you know, biking, better biking, better walking facilities, those kind of things as well. But I think the the, the things that kind of stood out most were they, they definitely want more pavement maintenance and um, or they felt that, you know, that could be improved and um, and yep, definitely concerns about um, the traffic. So you know, I think that's pretty broad. Um, if you, you know, if I, I read through most of the report, including the comments and, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of individual comments. It's kind of hard to know exactly where to put that, uh, those kind of comments in terms of real community feedback. But I think, um, you know, the, 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 there's an interest in walkable, a walkable, bikeable community in addition to less traffic congestion. So um, the two kind of fit well together, mm -hmm. I think if you, if, you know, if people are willing to walk or bike instead of drive, we would in, in you know, kind of meaningful um, numbers, we might, might actually make a difference with some of that congestion, but. Um, and, but that's generally what we're, programs been facing for the last four or five years or more that we've been working on is those same general goals. Yeah. Where is the retreat being held this year? Or I should say, how is it being held? Yeah, it's, uh, it's via Zoom. So, um, 
yeah, that it's a it's a Zoom meeting, and you can actually. I don't know. I, I think the last I heard, there was an interest that there's a pretty full agenda, but yet they were still talking about the possibility of allowing some public comment. So, uh, but definitely viewable. Um, there, like, hopefully we'll get YouTube working properly on that meeting, and we'll be able to see uh, that meeting live if you know, if you're not a participant. I actually think that we are live because there is a little box up and up says live on youtube so something's working i think <laughs> i don't know okay. how but <laughs> okay. so, so so i mean back to back to the goals piece it's it's i mean putting a transportation advisory committee lens on that and figuring out is there uh, you know particular areas um that the committee thinks that the city should, you know, should put first in terms of priorities. I mean, we can't ask for it all, or well, I guess we can ask for it all, but um, it's trying to figure out, is there, is there an emphasis on pedestrian safety? Is there an emphasis, you know, we've heard a lot about these pedestrian crossing, uh, uh, rapid flashing beacons, you know, do we, would we want to, you know, see the city pursue those at a faster rate? Are they more interested in, corridor improvements, and if so which corridors, um, you know, is there some other initiative that this committee would like to share with the commission as a goal? Hey, John. John. Yes. Um, Beaverton has that Hawk system. Uh, there was two, one on Hall Boulevard and one on Farmington um, that they had a lot of problems. Um, people on the trail there that would cross along Fano Creek I don't know if you guys have ever looked into that. They took it from, I believe, Phoenix um, is where they got the study from. And then they in, implemented two of them. Hawk system. Tell yeah. me more about that. Okay. So, so for example, on Hall Boulevard, right at Greenway, right just right over by the Washington Square Mall, there's a center, center lane and two lanes traveling east, two lanes traveling west. And there's a, a, a bike and walkway along Fano Creek that runs all the way um, through Beaverton and along that area there. And they had a lot of problems where people would not go up to Albertsons where it used to be in Albertsons and they would cross over at the traffic light. People would just run across four lanes of highway. So they looked at the precisions of the costs of putting in um, either a tunnel under the bridge, but then they worried about the flooding. Um, during the winter from when Fano Creek would rise. And then they looked at doing a pedestrian overwalk and then the cost um, of what that was substantial because of the clearance that they needed. And so they came up with this Hawk system and um, I can find out, I had, I attended a lot of the meetings so I, at the time, but, um, and now it was that way as a citizen because I traveled home that way and people in the middle of the night would be just darting across the traffic in there, you know, and zigzagging through the cars. So it, it, what it does is it flashes, it stops traffic both directions when it, um, it senses the system, how much traffic is going, then it stops both traffic, allows everybody to cross. And then once everybody crosses, if they've crossed, it flashes red, then you can treat it as a flashing stop sign and then it'll just, disappear and then goes back to normal. Um, I don't know what the study is on it, how the safety, but I don't know if anybody has been injured by it. So um, I, I have some, seen that. yeah. I haven't seen that in action, but. Um, yeah. I'll be happy to take you over there. <laughs> Show you how it works. That sounds like a variation on the old scramble system where they take an intersection and they'd stop all four legs uh -huh. and, and then everybody across it everybody time. go everywhere yeah for a minute or two and then they let the traffic through and then they do it all over again i think vegas las vegas is very um set up for that way they can get everybody moving all at the same time and they stop all the traffic mm -hmm. and then everybody goes whatever direction they want to go they have one of those in downtown portland in uh pearl district is it yeah i haven't yeah. seen that one very stops a lot of car traffic and lost pedestrians across whatever direction you want to go. That, that's relatively simple to do. My own personal th favor would be, as I think Bob would join in, is 
getting sidewalk infill done and getting bike lanes connected up. Yeah, sidewalk infill is always a problem with funding. Mm -hmm. It's always a it's it's always a problem of funding. It's always a problem of of where and when and whatnot. But it's always been difficult to even get started. And I think that first step is the hardest one, which is saying, "Yeah, we're going to do something," and then start doing it, even if it's one one or two houses at a time, to make it work. Well, you know, it's just a concerted effort by citizens to get a lot of this stuff done, as we've seen several times on the TAC, with people wanting stop signs or they wanting signals. Several times the citizens came to us for uh, the signals at there on Washington, and I think it's 12th where Father's Heart Ministry is. And then also the latest. Uh, accomplishment by citizens action was the <clears throat> crosswalks on Holcomb Boulevard that are going to happen. So it's just uh, a concerted effort by citizens can get a lot done. Those are those are sort of one shot things. I, what I'm thinking about would be saying for the next five or six or eight years or something, we do a thousand feet of new sidewalk a year to fill in some of these holes and make it so people didn't have to walk in the street. Well, that'd be great. I know exactly where that should be. It's on Myers Road uh, from uh, Leland to uh, probably the bottom of the hill uh, towards um, the, uh, oh, the Carl Jr. there. <clears throat> It, it goes from uh, three feet of, of bike lane to uh, less than six inches of bike lane. And there's no sidewalk and no lane for anybody. But my, can my candidate would be Claremont. Mm -hmm. but John, there's a whole bunch of money for this, right? <laughs> there's not a dime for it until we get, we get it. Get, some some effort going and to move it up in importance there won't be well i mean the the one thing that you know it's, it's always there is always this question of funding but um you know if the list were robust enough and the, the need were strong enough um I think one message that the commission would consider, we've heard from a lot of cities that have been pretty uh, successful with um, putting together a list of projects that they, that they think the community would support and, uh, and uh, finding a way to, to fund that through a, either a bond measure and increase uh, tax rate, or, you know, if we could combine that with payment maintenance dollars and, and, uh, and T, uh, SDCs, you know, to help fund the kind of the the existing um, resident match because we really don't have that, right? I mean, we've got gas taxes, which go for mostly for operations and uh, not much capital, and then we've got SDCs, which has come from new development. Um, we've got some where we've gotten required fee in lieu, but that's a small small dollar amount, but um, you know, I mean, the idea of putting together a, a, a list of, you know, 10 or 20 projects and a timeline for approving them, I don't know what the, the interest would be at the commission level, but um, if the TAC were to, you know, support something like that, maybe the commission would too. There's always the, the idea that we could do our own citywide gas tax, which we're not doing now, and we could and dedicate that to some sort of non-vehicular type uh, improvement in order to, with the rationale that it would improve the vehicle traffic because we're allowing them to keep from hitting pedestrians and bicycles. 
Yeah. Didn't the county uh, create something like that for gas tax? I think last year, or the year before. That was, yeah, or was that a uh, vehicle tax? One of the two. There's a, a vehicle registration fee. And that's that, right. That yeah. that's another um, piece that could be, um, you know, included with that. But it's a pretty big gap, I think, in those projects that, like the Holcombs or like the Myers Road. There's, you know, they're they're in. It's not like a new developer is going to come in and be able to build a significant right. amount of that. It's kind of like, you know, it's, it's already, it's an existing problem that um, has kind of gone on, on funded for years and, um, you know, maybe good reason for that. But if, if the community really wants the improvement, then is there, a, is there, you know, something more to help kind of get us over the hump on, uh, on the full project cost, right? I know I attended a meeting in 2019 of the Park Place Neighborhood Association, and um, they were pretty livid. That was my first experience um, living in this neighborhood, um, that there were funds that are allocated to put sidewalks to down to the elementary school, and um, somehow it got diverted. And um, there was because basically from the city limits on the very west, excuse me, east end from Kitty Hawk down to the Holcomb Elementary, you cannot walk on a sidewalk all the way there. So um, I, I don't know where that money went, but there was some really livid uh, individuals there that were really beating up on one of the city officials at that meeting about where's the money because they had already allocated for it. So maybe that's in a mystery bank account somewhere that we can be used to get those projects back open again. Well, I, I didn't hear about that necessarily, or maybe that's been a lot. You said 2019, so maybe it was February, I remember it was February of 2019. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Cause I just moved into my home on February 6th. <laughs> <laughs> they came over and said, we need new people to show up. <laughs> Welcome to the neighborhood. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <In an earful. laughs> I, I think that was uh, maybe when the new, I don't remember if I was chair then or not. I think maybe the new, the new chair had just taken over that year and he was getting an earful. That's for sure. Yep. The Park Place neighborhood is very active and very vocal. And I lead up that charge. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, it really gripes me. You've heard me say it before, but it really grates on me is these fees in lieu of. You know, they they get the the, the developers get to pay that fee in lieu of, and it never adds up because by the time that particular section then finally gets to the point where they want to say build sidewalks. Maybe it's 10 years after that original fee in lieu of was paid. And that fee at that time then, as years passed, might only cover 50% of the cost of the what it would have originally cost. So I just, uh, just kind of, it's a craw in my throat for some reason. You know, you, you get one of those things that kind of bug you, that bugs me. Yeah, fee and lieu, we don't, we, it's not our first choice, but there are scenarios where, let's say, um, you know, the, just the, um, the, the way you would do that project would require a much larger effort, or if the storm drainage system, that's usually one of the big things, or if we know we need a lot of utility improvements in that area, those kind of things can trigger the discussion of fee and lieu. But you're right, if we pay to accept a fee and lieu in 2000, 20 and we don't build it till 2030 obviously that the value of that dollar is not what it was in 2020 so mm -hmm. that is a problem bob but um yeah i the the good news is we don't do that very often and uh tim morgan to speak to your point i think um for the most part there's it's not well informed usually there might be uh you know i i don't know who the staff person was it was there but they it may be there for a different reason. And then uh, depending on how that, um, you know, community feedback comes in, 
uh, they may not have all the answers. And so, yeah, it very much comes off like they don't know what they're talking about, but they may not have had anything to do with the project. So, um, yeah, that that can definitely come up. But I think the bottom line is, is you know, you take you take these existing boulevards and you recognize how they were originally built and uh, the amount of infill development that's likely to happen along some of them or most of them. It's back to, well, that frontage improvement was never required of the original owner. And now we're talking about wanting a frontage improvement. And so how much of that should be paid by, um, you know, a, a developer? Well, if they're right on the boulevard, probably all of it. If they're somewhere offsite, then how much of that should there, are the, is their responsibility to build? And um, if, it's in, if it's a project that's in our TSP, the reality of it is, is they are contributing to those projects, but um, it may not happen because we, we charge them the SDCs. It may not happen in the timeline that we're looking for. We charge them the SDCs, but that project may be, you know, lower priority project. And that's, I think the problem that we see is, um, you know, differences of, you know, what, what's, what should be the priority. And when you got a neighborhood who wants walk, sidewalks or uh, more safety improvements, uh, and that, that's true across the city. Just about every neighborhood has a priority and we can't afford it all for sure. Not unless we, you know, do something like what I'm suggesting, kind of find a, yet another funding source for that. Oh, one thing that I have seen in some municipalities is that if you have a fee in lieu, if that fee in lieu is going to a, a specific uh, neighborhood or you know dedicated CIP project. So for example, let's take Park Place, for example, there may be an infill, some you know partitions, small projects and um, doing pieces here and there um, may not make as much as sense as doing a one, you know, project, let's say a, a, along the, you know, Holcomb, Holcomb Boulevard. So you could identify what the priorities are in a given neighborhood and then take those fee, fee and lieu from multiple projects and apply them a to specific project. And so, yeah, it may not be done on a, a street, but maybe done on a Holcomb, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, and we, we do hold those funds and map them to where they're from. And we try to, if we use them, we try to use them in a way that um, is, is, unlike SDCs, SDCs um, collected, you know, your SDC that we use may or may not apply to the neighborhood in which it was collected, but these fee and lose we do, try to honor the, the area where they're collected and try and pair them up with projects that make more sense. In theory, it'd be great if, yeah, if, if one small developer doesn't make sense to do it, but then a neighboring property owner does a bigger development, that's the right time to kind of throw it in there and finish their work as well. That's in theory how it works best, but Holcomb and the Park Place is so pocketed with existing and new, it's, it's you know, finding those these and lose and the way that brings them all together is 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 a problem. Well, most of the city is that way. About True. the only place about the only place that got developed in terms of consistency has been the stuff in the last 20 years. Well, I mean fee and lieu makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, let's say you, you take a street that doesn't have a sidewalks and somebody's going to do a two lot partition. And so they're, so you're asking them to build a sidewalk along, you know, 40 foot frontage on a street that doesn't have any sidewalk. Uh, I mean, certainly I think in those instances, instances does not make sense for developer to build that 50 foot sidewalk where, you know, there's, you know, maybe that's the only lot in the whole, on the whole street that could be partitioned. And then beyond that, you know, like you just would have 50 foot chunk of sidewalk. And I mean, that, that 50 feet doesn't mean anything. I, I would disagree in that you have to start somewhere. And if that 50 foot is done, 
it's not really 50 foot because you also have the driveway that's in there and you have maybe an extra 10 feet on each side of the driveway that you're talking about, which is easily done at the time the driveway is, where if you leave it, it's just another, just like the rest of the neighborhood and you don't have anything to point to who say, hey, we could take this piece and connect it up so that people could go if we only, you guys would get in there. And so you need some place to start. And these new places are as good as any. Well, I think that you, when you have infill is where you get into a question of where, whether it's fair or not. Let's say for example, you have home, you have one lot and on each side of that lot are existing homes that have been there for 50 years. And a developer comes in and he wants to build on that lot. Does the city require him to build a sidewalk? Probably yes, but will those other older homes ever build sidewalks on them? Probably not, unless somebody comes in and tears the house down and builds new. So that's where you get these body spots. There's also a, another little gotcha over there, which is sort of will be against my argument, which is a lot of the older places, especially the ones that don't have sidewalks, have property lines that are approximately at the edge of the pavement, which was the problem up on the, uh, oh, why is it, John? The one up there on top of the hill from Myers Road where it's been next to the school. God, God, God Gaffney. Gaffney Lane. Gaffney Lane, that property there. They're, they actually had property that went all the way out almost to the street. And the city had to purchase the proper purchase property. Actually, I think they purchased the house and re put the boundary lines on the lot and then sold it in order to get the look at the mess over in Kanema. Yeah. Same there. Yeah. Well, well we're all off, I'm we're saying, off. I think I think take you know, the city as a <clears throat> it's met you know, having looking, you know, if priorities are to have walkable communities, if the priorities are to have, you know, sidewalk, bike lanes and stuff, you know, you identify those and then there may be places throughout the city where you really want to have these amenities and, you know, this specific street building of, you know, you know, half street improvements for 50 feet and sidewalk and all that stuff that money today could be put, you know, from multiple projects throughout the city could be put to a specific project in a city where you could gain more benefit. Yeah, it may not put, it may not benefit that specific neighborhood, but if the goal of the, of the, of the, of the city is to improve um, the, you know, reach those goals, then, then I think, you know, those little developments could help, um, you know, maybe 10 of them can help pay for, you know, sidewalks in a whole neighborhood, you know, along one street or something. We're, we're really, you know, there's a priority to have something like that. Where, where is the greatest good for the least amount of money? Yeah. Yeah, so you know, I, I we're off track. V and Lou is kind of a common industry trend. It works, uh, but it uh, sometimes it's it's collected, and then you know how we use that. So we're we we now map that pretty well. So we've got you know staff have a better understanding of where Fee and Lou is collected. So if a neighboring development has it, we've got it in a layer in our map. I think that was pretty big improvement. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, if there's been key boulevards where it makes sense to spend that money, even if it was, if they were a block or two off of the street. And so we'll keep making progress with that. 
but we're off track and I apologize for that. That's, um, that's really my fault. I asked the question. But that's right, next, you did. It's your yeah. fault, Henry. <laughs> the next uh, item is going to be the letter of support for the McLaughlin Kinema Trail, Trail Grant. That's a mouthful. Um, <clears throat> John, I'm assuming you're taking this. Yeah, um, I can either. Can I share my screen? I sent I sent a link to this, but I. I yeah, just, let me. Do we need to do the chair and vice chair before we do that? Just throw oh, the agenda. Right, we do. Oh. We need to appoint a new chair and vice chair. Um, we don't have every all the members here. Gold Ben's absent tonight, so. Um, can can we appoint somebody who's not here? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would so. like to nominate Henry for another term. I was afraid you were going to say that. <laughs> I second that. Thank you. In that case, I'll nominate you for the vice chair. <laughs> and I'll second that. All right. Done. Everybody agree? <laughs> That sounds like a sound. Yeah, I don't see any way out of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, then we will move on to John's presentation and let me make you co host and, and share your screen. I don't have much of a presentation. Let's see. I just really pulled up a web page, so hopefully. Um, you can see that. Um, this is just the uh, McLaughlin and Kinema Trail Plan. Uh, if you remember this effort, mm -hmm. it was, uh, I don't know, 2017, 2018, there was a pretty consorted effort to do the McLaughlin Kinema Trail Plan. Um, planning pretty much ran that project with the support of Public Works. Um, Public Works is trying to pick that up and move that a little further forward. There was there's quite a bit of challenge associated with the work along the ODOT right away and the um, VFW hall. So <clears throat> there's a letter in your packet. I actually read it once, but I haven't read it in a while. But um, Josh Wheeler is trying to um, get together an application package to get this, um, this project to move forward <clears throat> with a uh, another round of grant funding that would help us really kind of figure out how to deal with the transition through the VFW parking lot, how to, you know, secure property along the PGE right away or, or how to secure right away uh, along uh, PGE property and some of those frontages along ODOT right away, working with ODOT as well, just to continue to move the design effort along. And so uh, we think it's a, a good, project. Um, it's a new grant program called the Oregon Community uh, Paths Grant Program. We think we're well suited to get it. Um, I can't remember. I can't remember the details of how much we're asking for. Um, but the intent is to get this to a 30% design so we could really kind of pursue in the future Get another grant that would actually build it. So that's how we tend to deal with these pathway projects is through um, kind of a series of grants. The first one came with the trail plan and this next one would get us to a much more finished design and uh, probably identify right away needs and then uh, you know maybe a third or fourth grant to kind of get us through various phases of construction. So um, is, there, is there any questions about that? Um, I've got up on my screen here the, the, the page, which if folks are interested in, there's more information to uh, associated with when they went through um, the planning process for the, for the trail. And up here on the top, just kind of this red line depicts this is the VFW Hall, the Museum of the Oregon Territory, uh, PGE, Kanema Park, the old Kanema Park, new Kanema Park. So really trying to connect the promenade with the metro land that uh, and the trail system through the metro land. And it is a piece of our loop trail. So um, 
I think it's an important project. And um, so, John, did they finally uh, settle on definite routes? I remember for a while there, they had three or four different routes that they were yes. considering. Yes, and this is the route. Um, there is a little bit of question about how to get them to cross uh, Tumwater or South Second, I guess, right here. So there's oh, okay. a little bit of determination there. But at one point in time, they showed a alignment that went down Tumwater through these properties. Yeah. And well, I can't remember if it was on the backside of PGE or somewhere else. But yeah, that that was that has been resolved, and we got clear direction from the commission that they did not want to see that happen. No, that's good. That's great. Oh, so uh, the the letters in your packet. Um, I can't remember. I could probably dig a little deeper if I had a little more. Um, do you need but, a Do you need a movement to uh, approve the letter? That'd be best. Okay, I I move that we uh, approve that. Letter of support for the McLaughlin Kanema Trail Grant. Second. Okay. Been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? Hey, Cam, sure. if you send if you send that thing to me, I'd be more than happy to sign it off and get it back to you. I mean, basically it's it's the one that I showed planning. It's the route I showed planning anyway. Yep, I will get it to you. All right. Uh, well, that is moving along then. So we kind of talked about goals. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> do you want to talk about them anymore? <laughs> at, at this particular point, I'd be rather, I would rather think that if we paid attention to our report a little bit in that what we've done in the past, it would be more beneficial mm -hmm. in terms, because in terms of our future goals, um, until we know for certain what the commission wants, we're kind of shooting in the dark and saying that our generic stuff that we've been doing before is, will suffice and if they had come up with something that is really down our alley then we ought to be able to jump on it i agree i i think it may be in our bylaws that we we're actually required to support the city commission goals mm -hmm. so they have theirs established we can't do much Yeah, we're, we're just making the assumption that, that improving by the pedestrian ability to use the pedestrian ways and the bike ways and, and increasing this, this crosswalk safeties and that sort of thing will generally be in conformance with what the commission wants, but they may have something more specific that they want us to do. I guess the only thing for me, Henry, might be, is there anything on the goals, the 2000, you know, a lot of the 2018 goals were those that are kind of running goals, right? They, they're, mm -hmm. and just, just a ver validation that nobody sees anything different or they feel like maybe they need to be tweaked to re reflect something a little more, a um, little, little updated or, you know, um, nice. and I don't have specific ideas in mind. I'm just kind of reading through them. Um, like if you start at the bottom of the list, so I'm, I'm looking at page 17 of the um, item four. It says at the bottom of that, it says open listening, open, li openly listen to citizen requests regarding transportation concerns. I'm assuming that's still going to maintain, you know, something yeah. that you'd want to, as a TAC, continue to support. Um, we, we, I think they're, you know, really, as you move from the bottom up, it gets more and more focused on a project, for instance, then. So, you know, we don't need to resolve this tonight. You're right. We can wait till the commission makes a determination about what their goals are and try to get these, see if they align well with the goals. Um, but I think the main thing is to make sure we've got them in your hand. You guys have, 
you know, if you've done any, you know, if you put any thought into it, let us know. If not, we can continue to leave this as an agenda item and bring it back after the commission retreat on the 29th and 30th. I have one that I think is like a, more of a current issue of the last year with the uh, uh, Black Lives Matter riots, protests that happened here and in Portland. I think that that would be, I think something that the city, whether city or TAC, gets more involved with, with you know, the DEI issues, diversity, equity, inclusion, taking that lens towards transportation issues. Um, I think that's something I would like to discuss more. I don't know if the city commission is discussing that, but I know that is also involved with what happens with the mayor issue here with the viewpoint on whether the mayor should continue. Um, so I think that's something I think the city is discussing. You know, residents are discussing DEI issues. And I personally would like to see that more highlighted in our discussions going forward as a TAC. So just wanna throw it out there. Well, Ray, just as a bit of a, of a starter, why don't you pencil out about two sentences that would take and kind of condense all that that we could throw into something so that we'll have something to start about and chew on when we come together again. Yeah, I will say that I did whenever it was like a month ago when we were writing suggestions that I did include a DEI uh, bullet point for uh, a um, you know a uh, goal for the for what we do for this year. So that I was focused mostly on uh, police enforcement of like jaywalking and uh, you know transportation policies on how the police is involved with that. Um, so that's one thing that I see that our TAC could be uh, involved with, with a DEI lens. John, is this within our scope of practice here? Uh, I mean, uh, you know, all respect to Black Lives Matter, Ray, uh, but uh, is this within our scope of practice? We're talking about uh, a bicycle, pedestrian, uh, motor uh, traffic safety in Oregon City and uh, once we get into profiling and jaywalking, I mean, we're getting into the police department, it feels like. Uh, but, uh, you know, what do you think, John? I, th I think it's uh, fine for us to have um, some kind of a DI initiative. I suspect there will be something that will inform this from the commission. So I think having it as a, you know, as a suggestion that we consider, uh, you know, after getting a little better understanding what the commission's thinking about that is okay. It is a little bit, um, you know, given the kinds of issues we deal with, um, how, how, what is, you know, what does that mean? Our, our meetings are open, anybody can attend them, anybody can talk, anybody can share their opinions. You know, uh, are we reaching out to those DEI uh, communities to, uh, or they're not DEI communities, reaching out to uh, underrepresented communities to make sure they know about our agendas, for instance. You know, I, it, it is a little bit, uh, you know, that it, it, I don't know that it's, I don't know how, you know, I, it's a pretty inclusive group already. So, um, you know, but sometimes I hear what, you know, is happening in other jurisdictions and it's a lot more about making sure that those people are aware of your agenda, uh, you know, able to, you know, speak to the issue if they want to, knowing how to do that, making sure if it's all online, a lot of people don't have access to online meetings. So how are we getting their input? Um, those kind of things I think are areas where we can always improve. And I, I don't have answers for how we do that, but if the commission's gonna give us some direction on that, then I think we should take maybe a little stronger position uh, or, or try to incorporate a goal that helps move that uh, city commission goal forward. One thing I should point out at this point is we've already taken one, one little step by putting a, this meeting on YouTube and not on the local uh, station that's only carried on Comcast. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, when I think about our topics and our, you know, uh, and our interesting discussion, our audience is, 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 uh, it's not always clear who our audience is because we don't know who's watching these meetings, but, um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it's it's definitely an open group of, you know, we've always allowed public testimony, you know, our, we're not really identifying quote projects. So a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of this initiative is focused on bigger projects, things like the tolling projects, things like, uh, well, I think the bike ped project on, um, you know, the, the Oregon Westland you know, bridge crossing project, you know, reaching out to make sure we're getting all communities um, understanding that that's being discussed and we're hearing from them. That's, that's a bigger deal. We don't have too much of that right now and, and you know, at the TAC level. But I guess, I guess I'll just throw out one example of one idea that I want to work on with DEI lens is looking at um, whether we should be armed when doing traffic enforcement especially like jaywalking issues, people biking along, you know, biking the wrong direction on the bike lane. Do police officers need to be, be armed in that? Or, I mean, because there's been a national movement looking at disarming police with traffic enforcement. Um, so that's that's one thing that I think is transportation related uh, that I don't think needs to be police only. Um, so that's one thing I would like to discuss, you know, in the year coming up. I know I'm kind of a radical, I guess, but I just, I see as a national movement towards affecting lives. So. Okay. Um, yeah, I think for the, the more kind of um, uh, traditional kind of um, goals or recommendations or uh, that I would expect would be, you know, safety kind of goals to, you know, are we interested in, you know, initiatives for that? In the past, we've done kind of the slowdown. I can't remember what it was called, Bob, you probably remember, or Henry, the, the, uh, you know, slowdown traffic initiative. Calming. Traffic, traffic calming. Yeah, traffic yeah. calming. And then, uh, you know, we did, we did that little brochure. Um, so, uh, you know, it's kind of more of those goals that we can accomplish. I mean, the problem with some goals is they're they're so big and our influence isn't really so at the end of the year we kind of look at that and go well, what were we thinking then and mm -hmm. so I like goals that we can well, uh, we can accomplish and feel like you know have been uh, you know a good use of your time really mm -hmm. so um, I can come up with some I think Henry could it'd be good to hear from you folks and I um, Kim I, I I think we did float. Uh, this request out there, we sounds like we heard from Ray. I don't remember if there's others out there. Is there a list of those that we've kind of received? Yeah, there was. Uh, I, I'd have to go back and look in my email, but there was a couple people that responded. Not everybody, but um, I can go back and dig that up too. <clears throat> yeah. Well, if you didn't respond to that, or Timothy, uh, if you want to, maybe. Maybe Kim, you want to get whatever the question was or whatever the, that initial email was to Tim. Uh, yeah. that, that would be good. And then um, if you haven't responded, uh, okay. But if you have, we'll try and resurrect those and make sure we get those out there and see if they align. But like I said, our next meeting is going to be after the commission goal setting. So maybe with those and with what we hear from the commission, we can, you know, put together a measurable, meaningful, accomplishable list of goals. Don? Yes. Um, would street lighting be part of our um, um, wheelhouse on areas where there's insufficient lighting in high traffic areas? Some of it probably is pertaining to ODOT responsibility, but um, I'll give you an example of one. Um, Redlands Road on 213 to uh, Prairie Schooner or, or, or what is it, River, Clackamas River, and there is extremely dark. And um, there's a very high speed of traffic that comes flying down there that's 55, um, but it's hard to believe it's that 55 when it gets so congested right there, um, right before you get to the, 
the Chevron station there on the corner. But if you look from there between Home Depot and Redlands, it's a, it's pretty dark. And there was a pretty serious accident there um, about a month and a half or so ago that the car was half gone. Um, I don't know exactly what the cause of it was, but it had a huge impact on the traffic there. And it was so dark that they, even the officers um, trying to do the accident scene weren't able to see there. But those are some of the other areas around uh, the city that probably have insufficient lighting and probably um, is contributing to a safety factor, especially now that we have these LED lights that are a lot more brighter and use a lot less electricity. We can probably light more sidewalks, you know, than we've had in the past for lower energy costs. So would, would that be something we could add to the agenda? That's something that might be attainable or either make recommendations to ODOT where, where they fall in versus where the city falls in? As I remember, the non-ODOT roads and probably the non-Clackamas County roads are lit by PGE. And I don't remember ever the city having much input into the placement of those. That might be erroneous, but uh, it's always been that, in my experience, that the city has accepted PGE's more or less statement that this is where they're going to put them. So John can always correct me if I'm wrong. Well, uh, maybe it's not a correction. It's it's more just kind of back to Tim's point. Um, we've got street lights that are ODOT maintained, city maintained, county maintained, and PGE maintained. And in that corridor that you're in, I believe that's that you're talking about, it's ODOT. Um, and so there's a new there's a phase of the 213 expansion project that we haven't built. When we built the jug handle project, which is Prairie Schooner Way and the whole under crossing and roundabout, you know, all that project. I don't know how long you've been here uh, in town, uh, Tim, Timothy, but actually, is it Tim or Timothy? Just call me Tim. That's my dad calls me Timothy when I'm in trouble, so. Okay, okay, we don't wanna go there. Um, so legally, when I sign stuff, I, it'll always be Timothy, but yeah, just call me Tim. Okay, uh, that's that's helpful. So, um, the, the, so when we built the jug handle project, they did upgrade street lighting quite a bit at that area, but you're right between Prairie Schooner and, um, and Redland Road and maybe even Holcomb Road, uh, that is phase two. There's another, no, it's, I wanna say it's a $12 million project to add a lane there and, and um, likely there's street lighting associated with that. So there's a project out there that would, that would build that. Um, but what, what I think might be a goal around street lighting is maybe doing, you know, oh, having a, an agenda topic about street lighting in Oregon City, maybe looking at spacing, uh, not so much the design standards, but just kind of looking at some of those older neighborhoods where street lighting doesn't uh, happen as frequently as in our newer neighborhoods and figure out if there's a, if there's a problem associated with that and if there is you know, what, what maybe the solution would be. And, um, you know, not, not, again, not taking off too big of a bite. We map all of our street lights and we map PGE street lights. So we could do kind of, uh, you know, a desktop review of, of uh, street lights and look for those places where maybe we think uh, we should, you know, maybe pursue an additional street light or something like that. But, um, the 213 one is, uh, I agree, it's dark through there. I just don't know. I'm, I just also know that it's a, it's a planned project. It's, you don't just throw in a street light when you're talking about a facility the size of 213. It's, you know, they're, they're significant facilities. Um, once you get off that at Redland Road, is there, you know, some solutions we could look at that? Because if there's, you know, if there's street light poles in place and they don't have, street lights on them, that, that, that may be a relatively easy change. That can happen with Vance calling PGE and saying, hey, we'd like another street light here. Can you get it in place? Yeah, the, where the, you come off Redlands Road there, right at Holcomb, um, to the south of that, the, where the Mini Mart and the Pizza Place, all that, 
that's extremely dark and there's a lot of traffic turning in there. There's really not a turn lane there. Um, it's just kind of where the road kind of just wise out on the paint striping. And then, um, so you kind of make your turn lane into that traffic center. I don't know how many cars per hour go through there, but I know it's a very common start and then it gets extremely dark um, right after that. Um, and that might be a spot there um, to increase traffic safety in there. I don't know what the police reports are for traffic accidents in there, but I'm sure that's, um, you know, it's probably on one of their lists. But I think that would be some of the things to look around the city is where, where do we have bad intersections with poor lighting that maybe if we had better illumination um, that could save, you know, bicyclists and things like that. John? That, that section of Holcomb Road that Tim was talking about, or Redland Road, I'm sorry, that, that Tim was talking about there, is starting to get somewhat uh, of a problem, especially during the evening uh, homeward rush hour. Um, I've been through there a few times and have noticed that there's a lot of people heading out of town on Redland Road that want to make a left turn across traffic into the pizza parlor and the and the convenience store. And they're holding up the traffic behind them because we've got a long line of cars coming down Redland Road headed for 213. Mm -hmm. And there's really not a chance to turn into that driveway. And it may be smart to start looking at that to see if we need to figure a way to get a, a third center lane in there or something to allow uh, that turning movement to occur. So um, I, I, I would say, I oh, uh, haven't seen it, but I believe you. I just uh, wanna remind everybody, so, 213. It's, it's, 213. it's another project in which to spend money that we don't have. Yes, I well, know that. I mean, 213 and Redland, 213 is an ODOT facility. Redland's a county facility. Abernathy is a county facility and Holcomb mm -hmm. is a city facility. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's, that's part of the reason why it's, why it's got what some it is. lighting issues out there. But that's not to say that we can't do a quick review of that and see if there's some easy ways to uh, improved lighting out there. Um, there may be, and uh, I'm guessing Vance, he's got his camera off, but I'm guessing he's listening and I'm here. He, he, he drives through there all the time. So he, he probably could confirm or, or at least uh, look at it in the future as well. Yeah. Yeah. Your points are well taken, uh, Tim, on that section of road. Um, Henry, you had mentioned uh, possibly putting in a, a turn lane. The conflict there is the relationship of the existing turn lane to take a left mm -hmm. off of uh, Redland onto Abernathy in, re in relationship to the driveway of the plant entry. Not, not to mention the grades into the Pizza Hut and, uh, and the fact that there's not too much right away on the county side. Right. Yep, that's correct. And, uh, and Tim, your question about streetlights. Um, yeah, I agree with John. You know, I think it's something that, you know, we're happy to look into, you know, here in, in operations. Uh, we get lots of calls just throughout the year from residents inquiring about streetlights on, on their road or in their neighborhood. And, uh, you know, we, we pretty much have to, to look at them all individually and, and see who owns what, where, and, and make determinations if we, if we can uh, physically put a light in or not, and things like that. Hey. Vance, a question. We have a map, more or less a map, that shows where we need sidewalk infill. Do we have a map that would show us something similar for street lights? Yeah, we've got a layer, um, Henry, that shows where our street lights are. Certainly. So, and, would and it be you might imagine the you know neighborhoods built, oh, you know, eighties. 70s, 60s, uh, a lot of them are pretty devoid of streetlights. And in, in some neighborhoods, uh, the majority of folks don't want them. And that's always tough. You get a homeowner that wants one in a neighborhood mm -hmm. like that, 
and nobody else in the neighborhood wants a street light. So those are some interesting conversations that take place. Well, that, that section we were talking about is really no residential or it's all commercial business there. And um, um, and I've, I, I turn at Holcomb um, to go to where I live, but I, I frequently go down that way also, maybe to go the back way up past the hospital or whatever, but um, there is not an adequate turn lane for the traffic that's going in there. Every time you put a 7-Eleven or a market basket or, or quickie stop or whatever you want to call them, you, you're going to get frequency of people turning um, in there and there's traffic that's moving pretty fast that's coming northbound on Redlands Road and it's coming out of a very dark area um, and all of a sudden you kind of get to this little oasis there. Um, so maybe if, I think if, if we were able to identify these things where there's issues and then then we can then from there determine if it's a PGE issue that then they pay for it which is good and then it calls it to their attention. Or if it's a county issue, then we have to talk to the county and say, hey, you got a problem over here. Um, well, let's get that on your agenda. And if it's a city of Oregon City issue, then, then we deal with it. We'll figure out where our money's at. Yeah, exactly. And, and, that, and that, you know, relationship that we do have with the county, ODOT, is helpful sometimes uh, in, in conversations like this. And sometimes the, the county, they don't know they have a problem until somebody here at the city, myself, John, Dana bring it up to them, which we're happy to do. Yeah, ODOT didn't know they had a problem from exit uh, 10th Street in Westland all the way to Oregon City 213 until I kept hounding them and um, the guy who's the spokesperson about, and it was about eight months that there was no traffic. There was 42 uh, poles that are out on the 205. And finally, I think when they did the, uh, the pavement that the workers actually realized all the lights that were out that weren't working. And they finally, finally changed the bulbs and found the shorts and, you know, now it's actually lit. Yeah. Um, and, you know, here you got people running across 205 in the middle of the morning, you know, that are not, are homeless. Um, you, you need lights to see these people, you know, living off the freeway. So um, I think it's just, it's, if we, we do our stewardship of by, identifying areas that we need and may have concerns, then at least we'll find out who's in charge of it. Mm -hmm. And um, the Don Hamilton's the guy's name. Anyway, he was getting, he was, I was, was very effective. I was very surprised how responsive he was. So he's a pretty good guy. And when you communicate with him, he's quick on the spot of um, calling you back. Yeah, good. Yep, I, I know, I don't know him well, but I have talked with him. Yeah, agreed. Thanks, Tim. That area there where that pizza place is, I go there quite often. And when I'm pulling into the pizza parlor, I turn my signal on and I start slowing down well before I get there, watching constantly in my mirror. So I'm ready to gun it if somebody's coming up behind me. Right. And safely. And uh, also in that same area, if you're if you're turning left to go into the pizza parlor some of the people coming the opposite way on redland road start getting get into the left turn lane to go on to abernathy before it is it's even a left turn lane and uh, they they threaten to to uh, hit you head on unless you're really watching it's a, and it's so restricted there that there's not a lot i don't think that odot could do as far as changing lane markers and stuff. So yeah. um, this, this same area I, took, I took the screen over a little bit here. Can you see the screen? Yes. Yeah, so this is that block that you're talking about, Tim. And uh, this is Redland Road coming off 213. So not a lot of street lighting in that area, not a lot of street lighting along here. So, you know, uh, I know Anchor Way is super dark, you know, so I think there's um, probably work at the tall county facility, but we should probably uh, reach out to them and BG and see what kind of solutions we can come up with. But I think, again, back to the goals, rather than solving this particular problem tonight, I think the goals are, uh, a goal for this might be to, uh, you know, spend, uh, you know, two or three meetings looking at reviewing um, kind of some of the gaps and maybe uh, maybe even inviting PGE to a meeting, that could be a goal. Um, 
with the, you know, maybe the goal, maybe the overall goal is improving illumination in some of Oregon City's more dark and dangerous corridors. So um, we've got, we, we do have some tools um, uh, that I think would be helpful. We do have some uh, partners with the county or with PGE that we could have for those kind of facilities, uh, ODOT as well. And then if it's our own, if our own, if it's our own little area, um, you know, then we, we definitely can deal with it. So I, I like that feedback, Tim. Great. Kim, what else we got? Anything? That is it for the agenda. Um, kind of took care of future future agenda items. <laughs> we know that we have some future agenda items. <laughs> um, does anybody else hey, have hey. anything that they want to add, talk about? Any, any other? Any, anybody have anything they want to talk about in the future that we haven't talked about before or at least lately? I saw in the notes there was talking about the traffic study on Holcomb Boulevard. Is that done or are we going to be talking about that later? Um, no, you mean in notes from the prior meeting? Yeah, there was some discussion in here about um, the traffic survey and um, what they're going to do. And um, I saw something about it said like April, I guess it's supposed to be moved to. I think that was the two, the bus, the uh, two projects that we were going to do up around Holcomb School, where we were going to do some work on getting the uh, sidewalks installed on the street schools street uh, safe routes to school program and and we put a grant into the metro for some money and they said uh nice project but we got better ones and we don't have enough money for you sorry but send your tax dollars though yeah <laughs> well maybe i'll summarize that in, in case uh others missed that um so yeah, we applied for a, a Safe Routes to School grant, um, sizable one, to be able to build four pedestrian crossings and several chunks of sidewalk along that piece that I think uh, mostly along what would be, I guess, the north side of Holcomb Boulevard. Um, and I'm drawing a little bit of a blank here on street names, but let me, I'm almost there. Uh, really between Winston Drive and uh, the Holcomb School Road, that was the majority of the project there in terms of sidewalks. And yeah, we didn't get that grant. We, we are moving forward with two, um, two rapid, uh, rectangular rapid flashing beacons down, uh, further down Holcomb uh, near Swan and Front. Um, Is that near where the mini marts are at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, uh, so that, that's moving forward. We're in design phase with that, <clears throat> that project, but, um, but yeah, we've, we still have this sidewalk connectivity problem that Bob was mentioning and not, uh, being, not being, I guess, competitive enough. It was a competitive project and hit a lot of the, the thresholds, but, um, oh, my recollect is there was, um, there was a certain criteria that just kind of kicked us out completely of the of the um, scoring well on that one. So, so are you looking at putting one of those flashing speed signs, you know, when somebody exceeds it with radar, um, or are they more like the at the curve there where it flashes so that you have a sharp curve right before um, Holcomb gets into the intersection down there by um, Redland Road? Yeah. Is it that flasher? sign it all of a sudden it senses when a car is coming down and it starts flashing to no the, you know? the 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 beacons we're talking about are help pedestrians to cross so if they're oh. wanting to cross a boulevard they can push okay. a button and it'll light up and flash an amber light so that was uh i think one there was there was four of those in total that were planned in the project 
these were two that uh, I think that Bob's group, the neighborhood thought were the highest priority. So we are moving forward with those. Um, the other two also had some challenges in that they're in uh, they're in an Enrod area, which is a, a special area for land use and uh, environmental protection. So kind of had some more hoops to jump through on those. And one of them is associated with the Sears development. So we're hoping to be able to condition it with the Sears development should that move forward. So, um, so yeah, not, uh, but we did, there was one other grant that we applied for and we also didn't get, but it was Park Place Urbanization uh, grant where we were gonna take a look at a lot of the side streets, Apperson, Front, um, Cleveland, Hunter, just that whole kind of Park Place area that was developed under you know, a county development years ago and try to figure out what, um, where the walkable and bikeable, you know, routes should be through that neighborhood, what, what the true cross section should look like. There's a lot of places with sidewalks with mailboxes right in the middle of the sidewalk. So you can't really even use the sidewalk if you're in a wheelchair. Um, just try to figure out a little more of a comprehensive plan about how that should be built out. We think that will help us with when, a, when one of these infill developments comes through and we can uh, give them direction on what exactly to build, where exactly to put the curb, how, how wide should the sidewalk be, um, you know, those, those kinds of things. Is there, a, is there a bike lane requirement? Or are they gonna allow on-street parking or not? Lots of times we don't have that kind of direction. We've got city standards, but it gives us a lot of latitude as to what we can adopt and you know as staff changes or you know over the years of development we kind of end up with a mix mash of different requirements that have been required and so trying to take the built environment uh looking at it as to you know what a new uh what um the unbuilt environment could be and trying to make those decisions and documenting them in a plan that's that's we didn't get that grant, but we're moving forward with the work. We're just going to pay for more of that work, uh, or we're going to we're going to use the money match that we had to try and get as much out of that as we can mm -hmm. for as many boulevards as we can. So that that's uh, I think Bob didn't uh, didn't you guys have a meeting last night on that in your neighborhood? Yes, yes, we did. We had a uh, it was a steering committee meeting, and we had a very good presentation on that. And even though the grant was not granted. Uh, like you said, we're still going forward with the work, maybe not quite as vigorously because of the money issue, but uh, it's, uh, it's kind of like a traffic system plan, but in, in more minute detail. Yeah, that's, that's our, that's our goal, maybe to have you know, at least confirmation of where, if you look at our TSP, um, and really, and you can find this in our mapping system, but, um, you know, we've got all the different sidewalk extensions, all the bike lane locations, what the bike routes would be, shared use paths. Um, but, you know, is there, that, that's at a pretty high level when we put those lines on a map. So really kind of trying to refine that through this study is what I hope we get to. Interesting. So did that... Tim, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah no, it was interesting. So we're that's postponed down to later in the year then. Or are they gonna do all that recommendations or is it all done? It's not all done, it's not postponed, it's just kicked off. And I think the, the neighborhood asked, what I heard this morning was that um, the neighborhood asked that the, there, there was a short period of time for comment. They asked that that be extended I think they asked for more uh, postcards to be mailed out to get people to understand a little bit more about that so that they could comment on it. And yes, um, I think that was it, right, Bob? Yes, that was it, exactly. Okay, so that, that's what the we're- postcard sent out to every resident in Park Place. Yeah, so I think that was, that's pretty easy to do, so. Um, that's what we're going to do. Do you want that um, web address for that Hawk system? Sure. 
Okay, so it's um, it's BeavertonOregon.gov slash or or forward slash one one nine seven slash hawk h a w k hyphen pedestrian hyphen signals and it'll give you the whole uh, story about it. There's two of them, one on Farmington and one on Hall. Both of them are um, f four lanes of traffic, two you know eastbound, two westbound with a center divider. For turn laning in there and it's usually in a high cross area where there's a lot of traffic so i don't know exactly where in oregon city we might need it you know but if you have a high density of cars with a lot of high density of people traveling or on pedestrian foot um it might be something to look at what it does is stops all the traffic it's not like a traffic signal in a sense like at an intersection but it's a kind of like the flashing lights but it forces people to stop so i got most of that beavertonoregon.gov slash 1197 slash hawk dash pedestrian <clears throat> and then dash signals and it'll give you the color code and all the all the stuff about it okay is it oregon city installing hawk signals in the malala avenue project between 213 <laughs> and i think uh beaver creek road that new, I think somewhere is going to be a mid-block mid -block crossing with a hawk signal because it's, it's too close to a signal, regular signal. I want to say hawk is a brand name. I could be wrong about that, but I think uh, it's a brand name. And uh, we're we're installing what's not a brand name, but a but a specific facility called the RRFB or Rectangular Rapid Flashing Beacons at uh, along Malala. Yeah, they, they, they call it a high intensity active crosswalk signal. That's what that's what it stands for. So okay. I don't know. Um, uh, and they imported it from Arizona. <laughs> so. I'd never heard the term hawk, but I'll look at it. <clears throat> yeah, there's an actual half a section in the DMV. Half the people don't know how to respond to it when they see it. It's kind of like cable cars, you know, in San Francisco, there's only one section of the California Motor Vehicle Handbook that talks about San Francisco driving with cable cars, <laughs> you know, but the rest of the state has no cable cars. <laughs> this is like Beaverton is the only place in the entire state that has this, <laughs> the system. Interesting. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for uh, answering that question. I appreciate it. If there's nothing more, I will, I will say that, uh, we can end this 35 minutes early if we're all in favor. Sure. Right, we're stand adjourned then. All right. Thank, Thank you. you for all for coming. See you next time. Well, let's see.